So I'm delighted to introduce three case studies today from Durham University, the University of Aberdeen and the University of Southampton. They each showcase approaches to engaging with different audience groups to make collections more accessible and diverse and to develop inclusive practices and the reach of the collections. The first case study comes from um, Durham University Library. Ross Wilkinson, the Learning Engagement Manager, will take us through how the team has developed inclusivity, diversity and inclusion, particularly of faith and LGBTQ plus groups in their learning and engagement programmes, academic teaching and exhibitions. And as, as an example of this, curator and graduate intern Ivy Hewitt will present how their academic how their academic studies have directly impacted on discussions of inclusivity in the upcoming 2025 exhibition, That's Gay. So I'm delighted to hand over to uh, Ross and Ivy. Uh, so hello, thank you, yes, I'm Ross Wilkinson, the Learning Engagement Manager, and with me is Ivy. Hello. Um, so we're going to start by just sort of talking through a little bit about what we've been doing. We're kind of at a midpoint, so this is quite interesting to look through and talk about the work we've been doing. It's I think there's so much amazing projects and practice happening, um, and we're kind of finding this quite an organic initiative process. So we're going to share with you where we're at, what we're doing, and how we're kind of working with various groups. So for those who don't know, um, up in Durham, uh, the learning engagement team and the museum and exhibitions team and the archives colleagues and libraries we work across a range of departments as we have the orange museum we have at palace green library the archive special collections the museum of archaeology we have the art collection which ivy is part of uh, we have durham castle uh, we have the bill bryson library we have temporary and online exhibitions we have the university of botanic gardens uh, which isn't part of our department but we do support we also do various digital engagement as well and thrown in there, including the Archive Special Collection, our various historic libraries and things like that. But that's just a bit of an overview as to who we are and the collections we're working with. I'm going to start with where our journey began, which was we're on kind of 15 years into our journey of looking at inclusion, how we work. And through various teams, we always say we might be the learning engagement team, but we're not the only team that do engagement. All teams are responsible for various levels of engagement that they do, whether it be with their collections, whatever it is that they work with. And one of the things that we wanted to look at was within the area that we live, uh, specifically County Durham, but also the northeast of England, was looking at who lives here, which communities live here, and who are represented within our collections, and how can we create collaboratively as best as possible, an engagement programme which brings in as many different groups as we can. So we work with lots of different school groups particularly, so that's quite a nice place to start because once the school kids are coming on site and they're working with, we start making links with families, they might have links to other community settings. So that allows us to expand and kind of link ourselves with different um, uh, groups living locally. Um, but we also have the student body, which uh, as a lot of you will work with as well. I want to kind of figure out ways we could engage. So we started off by simply looking at, particularly with faith, is how do we support people who are represented, particularly at our Oriental Museum collections, how are these people represented, how do they want to be represented, and how do they want to have inclusion? It was interesting that actually from a lot of that work, particularly, the main representation that people wanted in this area was just that people know that they're here, and that if you want to come and learn more, come and do it in somewhere that is a safe, inclusive space where you can come and have fun. So one of the core groups we started working with are our fantastic Hindu community who are absolutely wonderful. Um, and as well as the student group, we work with local um, uh, groups as well, uh, whether that be through volunteers who want to come in and help or whether that be through university staff or through students or whether that be through a whole host of different groups. And together, we've now celebrated our 10 years of Hindu festivals that we've been doing. And uh, they've been growing and growing and growing in, in, in kind of popularity, particularly coming up is Holy Festival, which is the big powder throw. And what I love about what the community were kind of saying to us is we need a venue, we need somewhere for food, and we need somewhere for people to come and have fun, but also learn about why this is significant and important. And from there, we've actually grown that out to be working with um, our local Islamic groups uh, for putting on our Eid festival, which is lovely. And I know a lot of places already do these things, but for us, we, we didn't, we didn't have that provision. 
So we want to look at how can we do this uh, so it's inclusive of everyone. And that was quite interesting for us because it depends on which groups you talk to. Some really wanted to do like the big, the fun, the loud and to have food. Other groups like, no, no, actually, we need to make this about the faith and we want to have it too. So it takes a little bit of negotiation to sort of say, OK, so how do you want to do this? So we want to have readings from the Quran, but we also want to have the food that people can enjoy. And for those who aren't of the Islamic faith to learn a little bit about it and what Eid actually means. So it's open to all and everybody. Um, We've recently started as well on a slightly different provision is looking at our accessibility, working with various families of people uh, living with visual impairments. And we've done a lot of work with families with people living with autism. We've got our dementia friendly groups up and running, but vision impairment is the next uh, element that we want to start working with in a bit more detail, um, mainly because museums aren't accessible. Our spaces aren't accessible for people with visual impairment as they currently stand. So how can we get collections out? We've run a few workshops where we've worked with people over the years, but we really want to actually get down to the core of how we develop this and build it. So we feel like over the last 10 years or more, we've begun to become inclusive of faith. We're now looking at, and we've worked with various communities, we're now looking at our visual impaired community. And then that's also brought us on, okay, so which other communities are we not working with? And brought us to the LGBTQ plus community. So, the, we were actually approached by a teacher in the first instance who wanted to do this and to give freedom for the group to pick, and this was a sixth form group, to pick LGBTQ stories in our collections that were there. We hadn't really done a lot of exploration into this. We'd done various tours for Pride events and we'd put on various workshops, but never done anything where we'd kind of handed over freedom. And that was really interesting because the stories that the children, well, if they children, they were pupils, they were sort of 16 to 17 year olds that they picked out were fascinating. And here's two core ones that they really enjoyed. So they went either down contemporary, it's the Daria film uh, from a uh, film postcard that we have from a uh, film from 1996, uh, which does, has a very interesting take on um, kind of tr what we would call trans However, it's not necessarily perceived that within the culture that it's coming from. And that promoted quite a lot of discussion and debate within the, the group. And when we spoke to the teacher, I said, OK, what do you actually want out of this? And what the teacher wanted was a safe space where people could express opinions and questions because not everyone understands or those who do understand and have experienced this. They want to be able to share and just to say, you know, with respect and mutual respect, what was your experience? And we used kind of the collections that had specific like these films. OK, so what is within the context of this film coming from 1996, coming from South Asia? What context we're we looking at and how do we discuss this and what language can we use? And what was lovely is one of the students, it was actually there. Uh, they were they knew the film because their parents liked the film. Uh, and they were able to share their experience and how they found it, which was absolutely fantastic. Because I hadn't seen the film up until this point, so then we went and watched it, and that was quite nice. The other story is looking at historical representations, and one that the children found fascinating, I keep saying children, the young adults, whatever you want to call them, uh, found it fascinating that in ancient cultures how things were perceived, and they were obsessed with this thing in the middle here, which is our lettuce, our Egyptian lettuce, uh, which was a symbol of male virility. Um, but where it becomes interesting is this comes from a story between the god Horus, who is depicted here as a child on one of our items. Uh, and it's often depicted in, you've got a stellar of Daedu here, whose lettuce is part of his offerings for his funerary uh, procession. And that lettuce doesn't matter who it was represented, we found that often if it was given to a pharaoh, because the story, and you can go research Horus and Seth's lettuce, and there's a whole mythology there, um, that lettuce is seen as that male virility. And they were obsessed with, okay, but there's female pharaohs. So how did the ancient world and the ancient Egyptians perceive gender when it comes to power, authority, and what was more important, the deities or not? And we had a really interesting discussion around that. I can go into more of this in the Q&A, but I want to get on to Ivy, because where Ivy comes in is we also, as part of our learning engagement programmes across the various teams, we run various academic modules within archaeology and visual arts. Ivy, 
who was one of our students, we thought, let's experiment with this and we'll take it that little bit further and see where our students can take this. And it's wonderful to say that as this has gone on, Ivy is now not a student, but a graduated colleague, which is lovely. So on that note, I will hand over to Ivy to kind of explore where we then took it within our student body to discuss these ideas and where we're going to take the project further. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you, Russ. So um, as I said, my name is Ivy. I'm the current graduate intern for the Art Collection here at Durham University. Uh, I graduated last summer in 2023 uh, from Durham with a, with a BA in Visual Arts and Film um, after being taught by Russ and members of the curatorial team across the collections here at the university. Um, and now I am the graduate intern working alongside all those who've taught me, which is quite an honour. Um, so for the case study, my exhibition, um, which is called That's Gay, which is being held from May to September next year, 2025, at the Oriental Museum here in Durham. Uh, that's what um, today I'm going to be looking at. So the project started two years ago now in the second year of my undergrad. Um, I was set an assignment to write a 5,000 word mock grant application for an exhibition that was completely of my own making. We were given complete and utter creative freedom. Um, and uh, the only caveat was that if we wanted the Mona Lisa, or if we wanted to have our exhibition held at the Met or Tate or MoMA, we would have to factor that into our time constraints and our budget, which we would then fake set for ourselves. Um, and having that complete trust um, and at that point, um, as individuals who only had aspirations looking towards working in the sector and um, with no professional experience being students, having that the ability to focus purely on the audiences that we were going to be catering for with absolutely no limitations, having that ability certainly shaped the way well, that I approach projects and audiences and how I hope to approach audiences and projects for the rest of my career. Um, and that was how That's Gay, a celebration of queer pride through art, was born. Uh, I came up with the idea for an exhibition that was completely by and for and of queer people. Um, and the exhibition follows three central strands, if you will, um, visibility, representation and celebration. Uh, and a couple of weeks after I handed in my assignment, uh, with no ambition further than just writing an assignment that I truly adored, writing. Um, I adored my entire degree. I'm a total and always will be an absolute teacher's pet, as, as Ross knows. Um, I received an email uh, following my submission asking if my assignment could be passed on to Alex Swinburne, who is our curator for contemporary art and one of the other curatorial members who taught me my degree here at Durham. Um, and following that, Alex asked me if I would like to realise my idea um, and obviously I said yes, well, after a few other explanations, but yes, um, and, uh, and, uh, and that offer was completely uh, separate to my current role as graduate intern. I had no idea that I would be applying for the graduate internship. Um, I didn't even know this was a thing when I, when I got that email. Um, and jumping to now, uh, we're in the early stages of my career and the exhibition, nicely coming into one. Uh, I'm currently working up a list of works and a list of artists. Um, so the exhibition will feature well-known queer artists um, and less than known queer artists and works submitted by members of the queer community uh, through an open call. Um, and they will be shown side by side, completely in solidarity with, with one another, allowing the audience to view queer people and their art and members of the community um, completely and utterly embedded into one um, and that really gives well that really will give the audience um, it will make them involved and really have that ownership over the exhibition which is of and by and for them um, and as a community that that advocates for diversity and um, and inclusion the range of works that will be involved in that scale will completely mirror this so um, all kinds of medium from uh, photography to sculpture to uh, oil paintings everything will be will be um, featured and covered in this exhibition um, and that really solidifies how diversity and inclusion is at the heart um, of every single aspect of this project 
not just in the artists and the art that's represented in the end product, but in the very fabric of the exhibition itself um, and the communities that are going to be worked through um, with and through along the life and legacy of the exhibition. Um, and to do this boldly and pridefully, um, and uh, and I'm sure I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, but as a community, queer people have reclaimed so much of the hurtful language um, that's previously and still uh, used to oppress individuals. Uh, and as part of that reclaiming process, uh, the very name of the exhibition is an accusatory statement. Yes, that's gay. <laughs> yes, these artists are gay, this art is gay, and that should be celebrated and celebrated with pride. Um, so to, to kind of wrap up this as I, I wear, I'm approaching my time. Um, two years ago, I, I decided to dedicate my career uh, or my life really to this, uh, to these audiences. And although I don't think it's particularly necessary or even fair to sit here and call upon individuals to dedicate their lives, um, I do think it, that the sector must be dedicated to these lives, to the lives of these audiences. Um, and I hope that that's something that we all can, can work towards. I know that I will be, hopefully, for the next 50 odd years. <laughs> I think you can all see now why Ivy's submission <laughs> came across so well <laughs> two years ago. Thank you so much. I'll stop sharing. Thank you very much, um, Ross and Ivy. It's so fantastic to hear people speak with such passion um, about their careers and about their sort of future direction. Um, for our second presentation um, this morning is, is coming from the University of Aberdeen, um, which fosters inclusive learning environments through accessible resources and services. We have Sarah Todd joining us, who, who is the Library Inclusive Coordinator. Um, and we'll share a case study highlighting the obstacles encountered by a student with a visual impairment and the library's role in addressing these challenges. So I'll hand over to you, Sarah. So let's get started. My name is Sarah Todd. I work in the subject and inquiry team at the University of Aberdeen. I work in the Sir Duncan Rice Library, which is the main campus library, the largest one. And I am the library inclusion coordinator. I wanted to touch quickly before I get started on why I chose the title that I did. The foundational purpose of our university is there on the screen. Um, this is something that really speaks to me and I think it's nice to reflect on this. So this is a summary of what I'm going to cover. I'm going to share a little bit of information about disabled students, some info about our uni, some of the challenges in this case study. We're gonna think about what visual impairment actually means and the practical ways that our library was able to address some of these. And then we're gonna finish off on uh, some of our other initiatives for inclusion. So here's a wee summary of um, an overview of issues for disabled students. They obviously face a lot of extra difficulty than your average student. Um, yeah, they might be quite far away from uh, their home support system, their social system, especially if they come to Aberdeen, being right up in the northeast of Scotland. Um, disabled Students UK has sector targets for 2033. These are quite way off, but there's a lot of ways that we can help. Um, they recommend six key ways to improve things. Those are using universal design for learning, creating an inclusive culture, creating a barrier-free path to support, implementing sufficient adjustments, giving students someone to turn to, and creating equal opportunities for all students. Next up, we've got some info about our university here. So the terminology that we use for the reasonable adjustments at University of Aberdeen is inclusion adjustments or individual student adjustments. We have a lot of support services available here for our students. So where, where do we fit in this? Um, we have four possible inclusion adjustments for students. Um, these include priority status. This is enhanced support with book loans. We do a fetch and carry service. 
for library users. We do one-to-one -one meetings for support and training for our users. And lastly, we provide accessible materials. We work really closely with other support services and attend monthly roundtables to share info. Um, we send referrals to other areas with consent and we advocate for our students. So here is a bit of info about the student who is the subject of our case study. They um, joined us from another continent and begun a PGT course. They were not eligible for DSA funding as they are non-resident. So that's obviously a pretty big barrier. They have a visual impairment and the way that they like to read is by magnifying. Um, so the subject of my talk is gonna focus on how we provided learning materials to them. Um, so the student obviously had a lot of challenges in coming here. They were separated from every kind of thing they already knew. They were separated from their family and their usual social support systems. They had to grapple with a completely new educational system, completely different terminology and a whole different structure. So when the student arrived, I met face to face with them to see how we can help. I feel it's important not to make assumptions about someone based on their disability. So we discussed how the student likes to read. They like to zoom in on things. They've tried read aloud kind of functions, but they find the weird robot voice very distracting and just not very useful. Um, so I spoke with the student's main tutor to get a list of key resources that were needed for teaching. And this is the focus of my talk today. So let's consider what visual impairment actually means. So the RNIB tells us that visual acute, that vision is made up of two parts. So this is acuity, that's the middle part of your vision that you can focus. And you also have the field. This is the peripheral part of your vision at the sides. It, I think it's quite an interesting thing to do for people who have no visual impairment to try reading using only your peripheral vision. This is extremely tiring, very demanding physically, but also mentally. So it can be very difficult for students to engage with materials that they need. So when it comes to our library, how do we make our collections, our modern collections accessible? Our libraries have a digital first policy, but licenses are not uniformly available for every book and journal. Sometimes licenses are prohibitively expensive if they're even available at all. A lot of you will already know that if you work in academic libraries, it's extremely complicated. Also to note that the accessibility of electronic materials is quite variable. Electronic does not automatically mean more accessible. The materials themselves may be quite restrictive. Maybe users can only read from a screen. They can't download individual chapters or the full text to use with their software. Or um, sometimes the files are restricted to certain types of software to open files and the files might expire after a short time. So what we can do in order to provide accessible materials is use section 31B of the CDPA. And this provides an exemption for disabled people where authorized bodies like us librarians can request or create accessible copies for our users. These are only made for the individual use on a personal basis for the student and we ask our users to not share or distribute these items. So let's take you through the process of us sourcing these accessible items. Our first step is to launch is to look at an amazing service which is run by the Royal National Institute for the Blind. This is a free service and it's called Bookshare. It's an absolutely massive database of almost 2 million accessible books, and it covers a huge range of subjects. We can create 
accounts for any student or staff member who's eligible. And you can see there on screen that the membership criteria is really quite broad. After we create accounts, we train our users on how to use the database itself. And we provide training on using Dolphin Easy Reader. This is uh, the reading software recommended by the RNIB. Easy Reader makes it simple to customize the format. So users can adjust the font, spacing, alignment, color, and contrast to customize a display that works well for them. Also at the bottom of the screen, you can see there the request page. We can submit requests to Bookshare to ask if they can request new materials for us. This is amazing. It saves us so much time. It is so useful. So we submitted some requests on the behalf of the student. Some of them were successful and some of them were not. So where do we go from here? What's our next step? Next up, we use Searchbox to retrieve the publisher details. It's an up-to-date directory of all publisher contact details. It massively cuts down the legwork of hunting for the contact info for each publisher. I don't know if you've ever tried to find a contact button on a publisher website, it can be a nightmare. So all we have to do is search for the details, send emails directly to publishers and request specific texts. So this is what we did in this case. And we discovered that it was really quite difficult to find the text that were needed for this student. A lot of the publications were from smaller publishers or obsolete publishers, or the texts were older. So published like pre 2000, which means that publishers just don't have the files. So we could give up there and say, no, we can't do it. We're not going to do that. What did we do next? Next thing we do is we scan the books. So you can see this is um, the original image taken from a book scan. Do you think this is accessible? I mean, it's more easily magnified than a print book, but it's still quite difficult to read when you zoom in because of the quality of the scan. We Higher pixel resolution is obviously much better, but this results in really huge file sizes, which just doesn't work, especially when you're scanning excerpts that are longer than a few pages. The images need to be compressed because basically your computer can't cope with the size of them, which causes a loss of resolution and makes the text appear choppy as you can see it on screen. Also, the text here is just a photo of a page, so it's not machine readable. Any assistive software won't be able to read it aloud, and you can't really change any of the formatting without specialized software. So for visually impaired readers, I generally supply text in both PDF, so the original kind of image file, and doc formats. The doc format is used with Microsoft Word. So this is so that the reader can customize the formatting themselves. It's possible to do this in Word, so you can change the font, the sizing, the spacing, colors, contrast, all sorts, and use the accessibility features built into Word. For this student, because they, they read primarily by magnifying and zooming in, I wanted to focus on making the clarity of this scan better. So I'm going to take you through how I did that. So here is the program that I use to increase accessibility. I absolutely love Abbey Fine Reader. They're not paying me. I get no benefit out of plugging this. I just think it's a really great program that is easy to use. I know it's weird to have a favorite PDF editor, but you know. Um, so this is quite a new skill for me, but I find the software quite intuitive and easy to use, and it wasn't too hard to pick up. The product specialists at Abbey are fantastic, and there's lots of great how-tos and videos. The program automatically enhances and smooth scans, meaning that you don't have to fiddle about with lots of bizarre settings to do that yourself. So when you're taking a scan, what you need to do is scan it with optical character recognition. This is where the program detects the text that it sees on the screen. 
So there can be a lot of factors that affect how well OCR works. This includes things like the physical condition of the book, any folds or marking or damage or just the age of the book. The quality of the original scan, you saw before it was very choppy, that can affect things. And um, special characters can also affect the accuracy. You can see here that there are some highlighted se sections on the screen. This is where Fine Reader isn't sure what the characters are. So it shows you uh, the original scan on one side of your screen and it shows you what it has automatically recognized on the other. And then you can go through and verify any areas of text that it's not sure about. This particular document contains a lot of translated text and a lot of the special characters just didn't work properly. The process of verifying the OCR can be very time consuming, I'm not gonna lie, but it's quite important to do this, especially for visually impaired users or translated text, as it really affects the readability of the final uh, file. So I did that. What? Let's have a look at the result. Um, so here we have the finished text in PDF. You can see here that it's still quite choppy. It's because it was quite a long excerpt that I had to scan and my computer just wasn't able to cope with it. So that's the PDF version. And now I will show you what the doc version came out as. You can see here that the characters are a lot smoother. It's gonna be a lot easier to see when you're zooming in and uh, our user could potentially change any sections to match their preferred format. So that was what we did to make sure that we were able to provide materials to this student. Next up, I'm going to talk about some of our initiatives for inclusion. So um, we undertook a big redevelopment of our library spaces. This is following student feedback. Um, we decided to redevelop an entire floor. We have seven floors in our library, in our largest library, and we redeveloped floor two to be a dedicated group work and social learning space. We also did the same in the medical library on the lower ground floor. And work is underway at the moment in redeveloping our law library. We also previously, and this is the Duncan Rice Library, we didn't have any space for creating displays for books. So that was something that we were quite excited at, about being librarians. So we now have this very attractive, nice bendy shelving you can see there. And our inclusive collections group plans displays around different awareness days throughout the year on different themes. Some other things we do are we ask our community for acquisition suggestions to help us add more diverse viewpoints to our collection. So we ask for recommendations through a web form around EDI themes. We have a small ring fence budget and we run this two times per year. So this year we chose Disability History Month and International Day of Women and Girls in Science in conjunction with International Women's Day. We've had a whole lot of suggestions so far and we still have a few weeks to go. It's really excellent to see people engaging with us in this way. With our reading list service, we also have a special tag that academic staff can apply within Leganto reading list software. This tag denotes text that should be bought to support decolonization of our university. So adding this tag submits a purchase request to us. And so far this academic year, we have purchased 62 new items under this tag. This constitutes 10% of all the teaching material purchases this academic year. So that's also a really positive step. Another thing that you can see here on screen is this is just the beginning of our creativity and wellbeing collection. So these items that you can see here were very kindly donated by university staff 
um, to us. But we were also awarded a Development Trust Student Experience Grant to fund a lot of supplies. So the aim of this collection is to help students foster a sense of belonging to the university, to the city, help students connect with each other in a way that's not connected to their work, and just help students promote better mental health and increased focus. Next up, you can see here that here are some photos of our therapet dogs. We host weekly visits to all of our libraries and these are super duper popular. These happen in our main and medical libraries and have just started in our law library. The image there on the left is our most liked image ever on social media and you can see why. This is Nevis. She is a flat coat retriever and she's just a bundle of joy. On the right, we have Nelson. He's a very good boy and he is just a gorgeous rough collie. We also hold regular meetings with the student experience engagement and wellbeing team and the students union. These meetings are an excellent way for us to share ideas and plan for hosting activities to promote wellbeing in our libraries. We've hosted breathing sessions, yoga sessions, and we also host a dedicated wellbeing lounge during assessment periods for our students. We have a lot more groups in the works. We have a puzzle group coming up, a gaming group, and crafting groups are upcoming. That's going to be held this Wednesday, our first one. Um, the last slide here shows our public library branch. This is on the ground floor of our Sir Duncan Rice Library. This is run by Aberdeen City Council and it helps us just connect with the wider community around us, not just within our university. So they have a separate collection which complements our academic one and the aim is to promote reading for pleasure. The City Library staff have just started running book bug sessions here. These are story and song sessions for young children and it's just a way to get lots of little people in our library, which is lovely. You can see here on screen, here are some of the resources that I have cited in the course of this presentation. And that's me finished. Thank you so much for your time. Please get in touch with me if you'd like to discuss anything. Thank you very much, Sarah. Oh, um, thank you. <laughs> and great to end on a, on a very cute picture of a dog. Oh, sorry, that's my own dog. He's not a therapist. <laughs> um, just a quick reminder to everyone, um, if you do have any questions, um, please submit them through the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Um, in the final case study entitled Heartstopper, Sustaining the Library LGBTQ Love Affair, David Wright, um, Associate Library Director for User Experience at the University of Southampton, uh, we'll consider why libraries continue to matter to queer people and we'll share some ideas on how we can continue to diversify our collections and ensure positive engagement with our LGBTQ plus customers. So I'll hand over to David. Good morning, everyone. David Wright here from the University of Southampton. Um, I'm the Associate Director for User Experience. So my team are responsible for the four libraries that make up the University of Southampton Library Service here. And what I wanted to talk about today was the work that we've been doing, particularly to support our LGBTQ community um, in the library as well. It's an appropriate time, I think, for us to be uh, looking at this. We're coming to the end of LGBT History Month in the UK at the moment. That runs throughout February. And I know that libraries across the UK, in the academic sector, in the public sector, uh, a lot of libraries will have been celebrating uh, LGBT History Month. It's a great opportunity to uh, share our collections with our users. Um, I wanted really to start by saying a couple of things. There are things that I will touch on in my presentation 
that you've heard in other colleagues' presentations prior to this as well. Uh, I don't think we do anything particularly special here at Southampton, but I think as well it is quite good just to remind ourselves why it matters that we actually do do some of these things. And because of History Month, I really want to set the context of uh, supporting our LGBTQ communities a little bit more in the, in the course of the next 20 minutes. I want to kind of hopefully remind you about why libraries matter to uh, queer people, to LGBTQ people, and share some ideas about how we can continue to diversify our collections and to make sure that we've got an ongoing and positive engagement with our LGBTQ users as well. I'll just say a note about language and um, a previous speaker I noticed picked up on this as well. I tend to use the words LGBTQ and queer interchangeably now. Um, I think as said, was said earlier, a lot of young people, particularly in the community are starting to reclaim that word queer. It can feel quite um, uncomfortable, I think, to particularly people, older people in the LGBTQ community. It was very much seen as a slur when, when we were perhaps younger people. But curiously enough, what became a slur for younger people was the word gay. And again, you've seen that in the pre previous presentation in that, that word of that's so gay, that phrase that, that became quite offensive to them. And they found some empowerment in, in uh, owning that word queer again. So as I say, I'll kind of use the words interchangeably really as I go through this session today. I don't know how many of you saw the, uh, the drama series that Channel 4 ran over the last couple of years called Heartstopper. Um, it was a very, um, I think, very touching and very positive um, story of a group of young people going through their secondary school experience together and finding their own identities in terms of sexuality and gender identity as well. I was particularly moved by the very last scene in the season two finale, and I'm sorry if I'm giving any uh, spoilers away here to anybody who hasn't seen the series yet, but the character you see on screen here, Isaac, um, was involved by the school library in setting up a book display for uh, Pride Month in June. And one of the books that was actually featured in the display is called Ace, um, and one of the scenes shows Isaac going into um, the library on his own one evening and actually borrowing this book, uh, which is about asexuality. And Isaac himself is a quiet man. He's been reading a lot through the series and he's struggling again to come to terms with his own sexuality, trying to figure out exactly what that is. And the suggestion in the way that this is actually depicted in the series is that the book actually helps him to start to understand his own feelings and his own sense of his sexuality. And as somebody who's worked in libraries for 30 years myself, I, I found this a really moving scene within there and a real reminder of the role that we can play. Books featured all the way through the, the series of Heartstopper. Um, uh, the, the author herself, I think, obviously is a huge reader and a fan of libraries as well. And it actually read to some of the, it, it led to some of the more um, diehard fans of the series picking up the books that uh, the characters were actually reading across the series. And then a whole, quest, a whole series of book lists appeared that were actually picking up on the books that had, had been depicted in the series. And they'd been chosen very, very carefully. They reflected not only uh, LGBTQ culture, but they were picking up on things like women's identity. Uh, one of the characters at, thing, at some point was reading Albert Camus' book, The Outsider. So again, just picking up that, on that sense of being a little bit different. And I think, again, for me, it was, terrific to see such a positive representation of reading and libraries in a, a series that was so very clearly uh, attracting a very young audience or a teenage audience um, in, their, uh, in, in following it really as well and getting behind it. There's nothing new really to libraries being seen as a safe space for LGBTQ people. Um, the author Jeanette Winterson published her first book back in the 1980s called Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit, talked about her own childhood, 
um, where she was brought up, she was an adop uh, adopted, and it was a fictional depiction of the, the childhood, where there was a lot of tension between the religious upbringing that she was having, and again, her own sense of herself, and again, her sexual identity. And she's talked a lot about the importance of libraries to her as she was growing up. I think if you look at interviews with any LGBTQ writer, there will be some point at which they will actually talk about why libraries have actually mattered to them. And this book that I'm mentioning on the screen here, Why Be Happy When You Could Be Normal, is a lovely counterpoint to Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit. Oranges was a fictionalized account of Jeanette Winterson's young uh, her childhood and her teenage years. Uh, Why Be Happy was actually her looking at this uh, from a non-fiction angle and starting to actually analyze her own journey uh, across that period and through life as well with her sexuality and her sense of identity. I also can bring something of a personal perspective to this as well. Uh, I'm a gay man. Um, I was coming to terms with my own sexuality as a teenager at the end of the 1970s. And it wasn't a positive place for a young gay man to be trying to establish his identity at the time. I was growing up in Newcastle. The gender roles were very, very fixed. Men were you know, expected to behave in a very particular way. And if you didn't do that, you really had that sense of feeling uh, othered and, and feeling like an outsider really. And what I actually discovered was that the library again was a place of sanctity for me. And I borrowed this book when I was 14 years old from the library, the city centre library in Newcastle, a um, book called A Lasting Relationship, Homosexuals and Society. It's a very academic book. Um, one of the early ones that was being produced at that time, there wasn't a huge amount that was being written back then around the LGBTQ community. But I can remember being absolutely terrified taking it to the desk we didn't have self-checkout in those days. I had to have it stamped out by somebody who was actually at the desk uh, at, at the entrance to the library. And I was, my heart was racing when I took this to issue it. And the librarian took it off me, stamped the book and never battered an eyelid. And I just think that was a kind of pivotal moment for me in how I regarded librarians and libraries. They weren't judgmental. Nobody was asking me why I was borrowing this book. Nobody was telling me that I shouldn't be borrowing this book. There was just an acceptance that actually access to information was important for young people. And therefore I should actually be able to see this and read it for myself. I think that's particularly important. Again, I'm incredibly sad to find that in 2023, we're having to kind of restate the role of libraries and I think in many ways, libraries are probably more under attack that in 2023 than they were really looking back at any of the period that I've been involved in the sector. We obviously had in the UK Section 28 uh, in the 1980s that made things difficult for public authorities uh, in terms of that uh, odd um, phrase that was used at the time around promoting homosexuality. Um, but um, what we're seeing now is a lot of challenges to the stock that we're holding, um, and particularly, again, in, in the US, I think, this is focused quite a lot on LGBTQ titles. You can see from this article that appeared in The Guardian last year that a book by Juno Dawson uh, called This Book is Gay, which again is, is aimed at teenagers, was among the book, books that was most targeted in the USA, for removal from library collections. So how do we actually respond to this as libraries? Here at Southampton, we're in the course at the moment of very big collections uh, reassessment. Uh, we're shrinking our print collection at the main Hartley Library here, uh, because again, we've seen some of the print use falling over the years. Um, but what we've done in terms of the approach to this project to reshape that collection is used it as an opportunity again to restate our, our commitment to intellectual freedom. So again, we have a very clear statement that sets out uh, what it is that we are intending to do as a library, that we're not here as censors. We're drawing on those statements that are made by uh, respected library bodies uh, 
Diffler is on there, Oral UK themselves, their statement on intellectual freedom as well. And again, I think my first kind of tip to you would be um, to make sure that you actually have a statement ready for this in terms of how the library actually approaches inclusivity across its collections, because it feels to me as though um, libraries are suddenly uh, a, a, a good uh, opportunity by some journalists uh, to actually create some stories that can start to provoke a little bit of controversy. I hesitate to use the word clickbait, but you know it is something that is a, a, a particular line. So when we were starting to work on our collection here in Southampton, for instance, the local press weren't coming along to say, it's really interesting that the library is modernizing its collection here now. What they wanted to know was, why are you throwing books away? So I think there is a slightly hostile atmosphere out there at the moment. And it's important, I think, as libraries that we are ready to be able to actually respond to that uh, and work with our colleagues elsewhere in the university around our comms to make sure that we're ready to just uh, pick up on that as well. Another thing that I know has come through to us, and you may well have had it in your own libraries, is being asked whether we're putting trigger warnings in our catalogue records as well. Seems to be uh, a freedom of information request that comes through uh, fairly regularly for us now as well. So it's a very interesting environment, I think, that we're moving uh, into. And I think for me, it just re-emphasizes the need for libraries to continue to be a place that welcomes not just people from the LGBTQ community, but people from all minorities really, who you know, find themselves perhaps feeling othered, feeling excluded from other areas of society as well. The library can actually continue to be a place where they see themselves reflected, uh, and they see their cultures reflected and they can learn more about their, either about themselves or about the backgrounds and, and the, the environments that they're operating in. Again, we've seen previous speakers talking about the importance of all involving users in shaping your collections. Uh, again, universities are great places uh, to actually connect to different groups. We have a, a, an LGBTQ staff and student network here at Southampton. So we work very closely with them to try and establish connections to make sure that they can make recommendations for titles to include in our stock here as well. And again, I'm, I'm, I know there will be other libraries who probably are, are much more active or see academics who are much more active in this field, but there will be academics who have an interest in queer studies as well. And can they actually help us to make sure that the community is actually reflected in the books that we have within our collections here as well. We have a web page that makes it very easy for students and staff to actually identify um, titles that might be particularly relevant to their areas. So uh, this is our diversity, inclus inclusion and belonging page that just then allows students to have a jumping off point into different areas of the collection. So uh, our trans uh, titles would be fe featured there, uh, the bisexual titles, uh, the, the things that are dealing with uh, women's history and so on can all be accessed from this one page. It's important as well to remember that you can draw on your own library staff. When I was researching this talk, I noticed that the University of London, uh, the Senate House library staff have actually made some recommendations themselves. And uh, I know from my personal experience, there are a lot of LGBTQ people working in libraries. Again, it's always felt like a very welcoming and accepting place for me as an employee as well. And um, so, you know, why not tap into some of that knowledge and experience as well and uh, invite your staff to do that. You often see it in bookshops. Waterstones will have, you know, a, a little tag against a book that's been recommended by one of their booksellers. So, you know, it's something else we can perhaps bring into our library collections in order to highlight that diversity that we have. 
Language, as I said at the beginning of this talk, is something that's very important um, and making sure that we're actually getting the right language and that we're keeping up to date with the way that language changes and evolves, I think is a, is a crucial part of our role here as libraries. So it's not just about what's in our collections, it's also how we're describing those as well. We work again very closely with our central equality, diversity and inclusivity team in the university. They have produced an introduction to inclusive language. And this is a shared resource again as well. It's not something that is produced by one person who you know, is, has done a survey of, of where language is at. This is one that is actually drawing on the lived experience of people who are in different communities, whether that's LGBTQ, whether it's uh, neurodiverse communities perhaps as well, and actually feeding in some of the terminology that they're using here. That means we can then actually draw on this when we're starting to describe some of the items that we have in our collections. There are more resources becoming available uh, on the internet as well that can actually support this. So you may be aware of the wonderfully named Homosaurus, which is an international uh, collective project that is bringing together some LGBTQ specific vocabulary, which is, you know, again, being uh, run by librarians from across the world who want to try, try and make sure that some of the, um, the main sources that we use, the Library of Congress subject headings, for instance, can be supplemented by some of these additional terms that might not yet have made their way into these very formal and very structured hierarchies that we have uh, in, in, in place that we use to describe the material in the collections. <clears throat> Excuse me, there's also a queer metadata collective group um, who are actually, again, looking at how we describe items in our collections that reflect LGBTQ experience um, and what we can actually do to make sure, first of all, that they're discoverable in, in terms of students coming in with a different perception of the language that they're using, perhaps, to previous generations as well, but also making sure that we're not actually going to be causing offence by terms that we actually have within our catalogues as well. Uh, one of my previous speakers, one of our previous speakers touched on that celebration of events and awareness days. Now, when it comes to the LGBTQ community, you have a wealth of days to actually celebrate across the year. Uh, it can be a little bit overwhelming, I find, even as a queer person myself now, there seems to be something coming up in almost every month now that is looking at some different aspect of the LGBTQ community. So again, if that's a tricky one to do, then why not focus perhaps on some of the, uh, the less visible areas of that community as well? By Visibility Day comes up in September. There's still a lot of misunderstanding I think around bisexuality and again bi bisexual people can quite often find themselves subjected to discrimination from two angles they're not really part of the heterosexual community but actually the gay community traditionally quite often has seen them as rather suspect and and you know there is that perception that sometimes somebody who is bi is actually just on a journey and will eventually become gay. It's, you know, not something really that I think uh, we would want to see in 2023. So there's still a lot of learning to do around that. And bisexuality, I think, is an identity that a lot of younger people now are starting to uh, explore and it resonates with them. And again, uh, Ace Week comes up in October. That's asexuality starts, you know, takes us back to the start of this discussion with our character from, from Heartstopper. And these are some of the areas of the LGBTQ community that perhaps are less familiar to our staff, to our students, uh, and maybe something that we can help to uh, throw some light on as well by highlighting some of the resources that are around in these particular areas. Um, this one's being very slow to load. If you have the capacity to um, present some uh, um, sessions yourself, you can also uh, you know, organize some events that tie in with these awareness months. Uh, I did, sorry about that, I, those two, two slides have moved on very, very quickly. Um, I hosted an event for LGBTQ History Month that focused on LGBTQ mental health 
this month. There is a theme uh, to LGBTQ History Month this year that looks at health and medicine. So we brought in uh, the author of the Queer Mental Health Workbook to do an online session in conversation with us. And last night, the university held uh, the 12th or 13th 12th, I think, Stonewall, annual Stonewall lecture, which again is looking at uh, a queer perspective on history. And again, just making sure that we've actually got the stock, uh, you know, the books that are actually written by the authors who are actually coming in here as well to talk to us is another way we can make sure that we're actually allowing people then to explore the ideas they're hearing in these sessions and follow up through the library as well. There are lots of resources and communities for librarians around this as well. Uh, I've just highlighted a couple of things that I've picked up here. Uh, SILIP, uh, the um, uh, library network, has an LGBTQ plus network for librarians as well. Uh, SILIP in Scotland uh, produces some resources for libraries and librarians around LGBTQ plus resources. And again, Leeds University here uh, have an LGBTQ archives project underway as well. So there's a lot of things that we can plug into. We don't have to be reinventing the wheel as we start to try and make sure that we're diversifying our collections and making them available and visible to our users as well. So I hope I've kind of shared some of the thoughts, some of the things that we've started to do here at Southampton why it actually matters that we're still reaching out to our LGBTQ communities, how that community is changing constantly really with each new generation that's coming into our universities as well. And I hope that this helps you to, um, you know, look at making your libraries welcoming places for the generation of uh, heartstopper uh, um, teenagers who will be our students in a few years time as well. This is the lovely cast uh, getting together. I thought it rather looked as though they kind of had their A-level certificates here. So, you know, these are the people who will be joining the university in the next few years. And as I say, I hope we're gonna be in a good place to welcome them. Thank you. Um, many thanks for that, David. I'm sure that that would be a sentiment echoed by men, many other here um, about their libraries as well. Um, we've now got the opportunity to ask the speakers questions. Um, so if I could ask um, Sarah, Ross and Ivy to come back to the screen. Um, and a reminder, if you do have any questions, um, please go ahead and submit them in the Q&A. Um, we've got about 25 minutes. Um, so the first question, um, well, firstly, a bit of feedback saying great presentations and fab projects, but also asking a bit more about um, how your audience prioritization fits with um, the university's wider public engagement strategy and how much um, of the engagement work you do is shaped by higher up policy and direction. Um, so if I could go to um, Ross and Ivy first. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I think from a, a policy perspective, uh, Durham's really starting to shift quite happily. I mean, we're very lucky that we have a very well-funded learning engagement team um, and we have various museums that we can do different things. So particularly now, I think there was a big trend for let's work with schools and get school groups in. And now it's looking more broadly at wider audiences and things that we've been doing is trying to just work with collections and are being recognised as things that should just be being done. And I think I wonder if a lot of people are finding that within their own institutions that there's been good practice happening and it's now being recognised strategically and therefore is getting more funding and more impetus. So I feel like that's really lovely. So I think towards particularly civic university strands and exploring what does widening participation mean? It's not just schools, it's communities, it's broader, it's bringing everyone in. And what I am loving is the work that we've done with particularly younger audiences like primary school under fives. It was lovely to hear Sarah saying that they have under fives. Groups. I think that that's often been seen as well. It's too early. That being actually, they're a really important audience, and they're really valuable, and they should be brought into things and and given that space. And it's lovely that that's also being represented. So, yeah. Sorry, I don't think you want to add, Ivy. Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> Thank you, um, Sarah. I wonder if you've got anything you'd like to add. Yeah. Um. So, 
our strategy for the university for the next years is Aberdeen 2040 and it has four strands and one of those is inclusion work. So I think a lot of our departments all across the university have really taken that as a let's get going. So um, there's a lot of grassroots kind of work going on with the staff in our library. We all have our own little passion projects and it's work that is really enjoyable and really worthwhile. So um, it's great to see that recognized, you know, across the wider sector. Thank you, Sarah. Um, David? Yes, curiously enough, uh, we've been focusing this week on setting out the library objectives that align with the university's objectives. There is a, the way that we work here as a document shared that actually sets out what the university as a whole is trying to achieve and is then cascaded so that we can each feed into that to say what it is that we are doing that is gonna to contribute to that overall aim. And the first one I'm delighted to say is around improving diversity, inclusion uh, and equality for students as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it's at the top, I would say, of the university's agenda. We've seen investment in our central uh, equality, diversity and inclusivity team over the last two years, which is very, very welcome. And we appointed for the first time last year um, a, a, a vice chancellor with the specific remit around equality, diversity and social inclusion. And I think, again, that sends a really strong message to the university when you see somebody who is working in that very senior management team that has that specific brief uh, to uh, really start uh, making some change across the university as well. So, yes, a lot going on here in Southampton. Thank you. Um, the next question um, we have, which again, um, I think is for everybody, is um, do the speakers have recommendations for approaches which have worked well in reaching out and encouraging contact and responses from communities? Um, and I'll go again to Ross and Ivy first. I hope that's OK, because there is another kind of related question, uh, which you might answer at the same time, which asks um, for the exhibition, are you working with LGBT organisations and societies in Durham? Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so obviously engaging with communities can be quite tricky. I mean, if I take faith first and kind of work, because that was kind of the first groups we started working with, it's tricky because people have their own lives. And that's the first thing we have to kind of respect. You know, if you're working with a particular community outside the university group, um, they're giving up their time. They have families, they have jobs, they've got all that sort of stuff going on. So we found that we either approach through existing community groups like community centres, um, or we go to places of worship. I think with the LGBTQ, we're going down different avenues. Um, so I'll let Ivy talk a little bit more specifically, but in terms of when we started, schools again have been quite an interesting place. In a couple of weeks time, we're having a consultation group with our teacher advisory group that we have set up with Durham County Council, where we're gonna talk, see how schools are engaging with this, if they wanna be involved and kind of letting them come forward if they wish to. Um, and then obviously student groups we can approach. And on the whole, actually, they bite your hand off because we can go, we've got a museum you can do this in. And they're like, great, yeah, let's do it. That sounds fun. But then it is managing expectation with the student groups can often be the thing because, you know, as, as you'll know, they're what they want to do lots and we all have wide responsibilities and things. But I'd say with the community groups, we find that we either approach through existing relationships and that has taken years to do because the problem with a lot of it is trust and they have to trust where you're coming from and why you're doing this. Are you doing this for, for them or are you doing it as a tick box exercise? And if they, as soon as they think that you're doing it for a tick box exercise, they're out. They don't want to do it. It's got to be meaningful and it's got to be kind of with their, their, their aims. One example that I kind of get that, we really learned from was we did an exhibition opening where someone outside the university but made this and it was all through the south and southeast asian community and someone just blurted out i have no idea pakistan and india were the same country and a member of the community just looked at me and said well this is exactly why we need to do these kinds of projects and we thought right okay so where they're coming from is acceptance understanding and learning so that's kind of how we approach it and just being Quite open and honest is the other thing when we start talking to groups. Anyway, I don't know if you want to add anything, Ivy, about that gay specifically. Um, I'm just doing kind of reinforcing it as a speaking as a past student, a recent past student. Um, student groups always want to be involved, especially when when particularly with the student groups 
um, that are talking about their own identities. We we want to shout about this. That's why we're in those groups to, to begin with. Um, so especially when we're university institutions and we have such easy access to um, a wealth of lived experience right there on our doorstep, um, who are people that are people that are so um, eager and, and enthusiastic. That's what it means that we're approaching every single um, student queer group. Um, and uh, and then wider, obviously, with the their own collegiate system, we can approach every college. Um, uh, but that's quite um, that's quite typical to us. Um, but then also the the wider community. I think Durham um, again bridging that level of trust with with local um, non academic community groups um, or organisations. So we're working with a few uh, queer charities. Um, uh, that, that work with local people um, and trying to foster those relationships in a really um, real and organic way. Um, I think that's what we're focusing on um, and not not pressuring uh, people to kind of come to the university. Da, 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 da. It's kind of, we are putting on an exhibition for these people, of these people. Um, so we have to really approach that with grace and and really delicately and uh, proudfully but um we can't just sit here in our little curatorial offices or libraries going we're just going to talk about you um having that um again that that really that sense of autonomy i think is so important for the community groups within what we're doing together but we're focusing on a lot Thank you both very much. Um, Sarah? Um, one way that has worked amazingly well for us is just developing organic networks. We do a lot of networking, a lot of our staff um, do various groups across the university and are also involved in the wider community. So um, when we do this networking, we quite often make connections with people and they ask us questions and that will spark something out. I think that organicness um, is really important and that flexibility. It's, we've, we've also had um, groups of school kids come in and things like that. And I think it's great to connect with people in a friendly and human way, because we obviously are right in the weeds of our very specific areas. And it's important to be able to communicate that in a way that is accessible to people and doesn't put them off like we're some academics sitting in our ivory towers, you know. So I think the, the human touch works amazingly well for us. Thank you. Um, David? Um, I liked what Ross said at the beginning. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is going the end of the week. I've been talking a lot, obviously. Um, I like what Ross said at the beginning of the session, actually, which is that engagement is not just about somebody's job title. I think everybody in the library really has the opportunity to engage. And we've certainly tapped into connections that people have in different areas, both within the university and beyond the university as well. Um, I think the personal touch is quite an important one in some of these areas because, um, you know, there are sensitivities around some of this that perhaps, again, um, you know, an email, a general email is, is not really going to uh, plug into that. It can be about kind of developing confidence with people as well. Certainly, as I say, when it comes to sensitive areas like sexuality and gender identity. Um, it can be a very uh, you know, emotive issue. It can be something that whether people are actually out or not within the university is another question that, that always needs to be in the, in the back of your mind. Um, but I think, as I say, um, just using whatever kind of networks you have is, is really a, a positive way to approach it. We're lucky here in Southampton in that we have an independent community bookshop, bookstore, which is actually very close to the university. They do a lot of work around uh, social inclusion, really generally within the community. And we've developed very close relationships with them. So quite often, if we're hosting an event, they'll come along to sell books at the event. 
um, but equally they will help us to promote some of the things. So the online events that we've just been going through, there have been posters up in their shop as well to just get that broader community involved. And I think the other thing that is important, particularly when it comes to LGBTQ communities, is actually the visibility. It's one of the reasons that I bring in my personal experience to this because nobody knows from looking at me whether I am LGBTQ myself or not. I wear my uh, rainbow lanyard, which I hope again is sending a signal to anybody who's using the library that this is a safe space. This is somewhere where they are welcome. It doesn't necessarily communicate about my own experience, but I think just um, being out as a senior manager sets the tone for the rest of the library staff to feel that they're in a safe space, I hope, to, uh, to, to, be, to be themselves, to bring them whole, their whole selves to work. And I, I think there is a very close relationship between a sense of belonging in our user communities and a sense of belonging in our library staff communities as well. I don't think you can have one without the other. So again, I would you know, encourage anyone who is, is comfortable enough to do that, to be open about their, to bring their whole self to work and be open about that as well. Thank you. Um, I've got a few questions now um, for Sarah. Uh, quite a lot of interest in um, in, in the scanning work. Um, I guess the first one, though, a bit broader than that, is is do you have a team to do the inclusion work? Um, yes, we do. So um, my team is the subjects and inquiry team. Uh, we are an inquiries team, as the name would suggest. So there are three full time members and we undertake all of the well not all of the inclusion work but we undertake the kind of direct support with our disabled community um and yeah it's it's quite a laborious process to make a scan book with all special characters and equations and things i would say okay so i did a 20 page excerpt for the student in the case study i would say that probably took around six to seven hours to correct everything and make sure it was fine um so yeah we're we're a very small team but we're very enthusiastic and we we love the work that we do um we also yeah the question goes on to say do we check the files from the publishers for accessibility we do um we find that they're not always um you know ocr isn't always enabled the headings are often a mess so yeah we do kind of spot check as much as possible but I mean it is quite a time-consuming process so we unfortunately don't have the uh, capacity to do as much as we would like to do but yeah thank that's you we are. there's also um, another question here about um, particularly about the Abbey Fine reader and, mm -hmm. and its ease of use um, and how it might compare to um, Adobe accessibility feature or census access so um, I've not used census access myself, so I can't really speak to that, but um, I find Adobe a little bit more difficult to use. That perhaps is just a personal thing for me. Um, I find Abby, it is, yeah, I, I find Abby is a lot easier to um, to use. Basically, it's a lot more intuitive. There's less kind of, strange wording and jargon that you have to learn so uh yeah i think it's easier definitely less strange wording and jargon yeah. like a definite benefit i know um there is uh, another question for you sarah um, okay. asking if you um, could explain more about the tag for the yes. decolonization collections um, okay. um what is it yeah, so that's me using weird jargon. So um, when it comes to reading lists, what our academics do is they build um, a list for their specific course. What they are able to do is, using a form, add a completely new citation for a new item which is not held on our um, catalogue. So they generate a completely new um, item. They add, you know, all the metadata, ISBNs, titles, all that stuff. And then once they've created it, added it to the reading list, the way that they request any sort of purchase or digitization from us is by just clicking on a little tag 
and there are a few tags. So essential item, please purchase an e-format, I think is one of them. And the decolonization tag is the other. So it's just um, the method that we use to have purchase requests submitted to us using Leganto. If you get in touch with me, if you've got my email address, get in touch with me off this call and I can show you. That, that sounds like a great offer. Thank you. Um, we have a question um, for David. Um, do you know of any examples of how inclusive terminology has been used to describe moving image footage in catalogue records? Um, the simple answer to that is no, uh, I don't. We don't have a lot of um, moving image footage here in our main collection, which is where we've really been focusing our work, as I say, over the last uh, couple of years. And But I'm more than happy to have a look and see if I can find something out, Heather, and I will come back to you on that. Thank you. Um, I've also got to uh, take the chance to, to ask a question of my own. Um, I'm quite interested in how... Um, all the case studies we've heard about today, um, how they've been influenced by existing collections um, and how they might have actually gone on to or go on in the future to influence um, collection development um, within your libraries. Um, I don't know if anyone's happy to, to go first. I could pick that up. Um... If you like, I again, I, I mentioned the fact that we have a very big project underway here at the moment, which is collection development and discovery. It's particularly focused on the Hartley Library, where we have 500,000 print items still, uh, which really haven't been uh, managed and um, edited very heavily over the last few years. So we've been engaging a lot with our communities around how we can actually reduce that collection a little bit. Um, keep a, a core dynamic collection here, move some to off-site storage, um, but then also uh, discard some of the material that is easily available through library networks as well. And we have very explicitly made a commitment to diversifying the collection as we start to go into uh, you know, managing that when we get to the end of the project as well. Um, so again, it was an opportunity for us to completely uh, revise our collection development policy uh, to, again, engage with people around that to make sure that we were uh, bringing a number of different voices into how we actually manage collections going forward. And it's, it's worked very well. We did have, um, you know, some, as you can imagine, some anxieties in some areas in particular, arts and humanities, uh, who are still very uh, print focused, I think. Um, have you know had some concerns around that, but I think we have managed to address that. It's been quite time consuming for us to do, but again, just that opportunity to share the library's uh, intentions really with its collections. I think sometimes because we're such a feature of university life um, and you know, a lot of academics who've come into the, the, the profession of, of kind of bringing in their experience from their own, their own lives as students in libraries. It's been a real opportunity for us to re-engage with some of those people. We brought them into the library, taken them on tours, talked to them about the way we approach things. And that EDI message is really always very high at the top of our list in terms of how we make sure that you know, we're diversifying the collection, but also that we're actually making it visible. So how we actually make sure that, that students and staff can actually find those materials once we're actually incorporating them into our collections. And that, that goes for print and, and E as well. Thank you. Um, I don't know if uh, Sarah or Ross and Ivy also have some reflections. Yes. Um, so here at Aberdeen, um, our staff group recently undertook a um, task and finish group to uh, look at collections development. Our previous collections policy is uh, quite old. I think it was last uh, updated in maybe 2014 or so. So it's it's well overdue that we that we do this. So we were able to develop some really clear principles in what is important in our collections um, and take care of what we've got. You know, we're we're an old institution, our modern collections are are quite old and it's important for us to highlight the diversity that exists here already, but 
also augment, you know. So um, what we do is we have a form on our discovery system Primo where people are able to submit comments. Maybe our metadata is wrong or, you know, uses outdated terminology, is offensive, things like that. So um, we have opened the floor to our community and saying what is important to you. And we do a lot of consultation with groups here on campus. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's great to get people, give people those opportunities. Um, Ross and Ivy? Yes. Um, so the art collection here at the university, we've, we've really, since kind of 2016, we've really been focusing more on diversifying the collection um, and really making sure that the quality of the collection um, is up to a, a museum grade standard. Um, so then we have looking at, looking through as I'm making my list of works, um, there's plenty in the collection and also we're looking outward um, to, to harness relationships with other um, other galleries and museums um, across the UK and and further afield. Um, so that's one thing that we're we're doing in um, in art. But then uh, we're very lucky that the um, exhibition is happening at the Orient Museum. And uh, the senior curator Rachel Barkley, as well as the um, as well as the assistant curator Jill Ramsey, they're both so keen and eager um, and love the idea of that gay that they're going to be including their queer objects throughout their own collections um, and putting them in their permanent displays. Um, so that that's gay. It's not just you know this and that wall and this little gallery. Um, but the, 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 the queerness expands the entire remit of the, of the Oriental Museum. And it's not just a temporary exhibition. These works are part of the, part of the permanent displays of the, of the Oriental Museum, um, which really shows that, 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 I think Ross touched on this earlier, but queerness isn't a Western thing and it's certainly not a new thing. Um, so having that, being able to look through our history, um, global history, um, and to see the kind of ancient roots of, of all of this, I think is, um, I think is really important and not just focusing on um, our kind of, I guess it kind of links in with that decolonizing views. It's decolonizing the way that we look at diversity and inclusion um, and belonging looking at all of those things um, and, and trying to look outwardly and see how other cultures have been doing and appreciating um, such diverse individuals for millennia. <laughs> the thing that struck team and I was you give a topic like this to these young people, kind of school-aged pupils, and they have really strong opinions, interests, ideas. They can shape, they can do it. And I think one thing that I've learned that I'd like to implement going forward, I think we've learned collectively as a team, you know, you, you take something which we saw as an assessment that Ivy did, and then we just run with it. And actually, just because it's assessment, you can kind of look at stuff. So even just within our own little practice, those little changes, it's quite interesting how just be a bit brave and it can go in all sorts of directions, which we were quite proud of. And we thought we were quite brave before, but then we'll see where this goes and see where Ivy goes. So we're doing all right. Always learning. 